I was always interested in old stuff, uh, and I, I used to go out to the uh, junk stores on Route 44 in Seekonk and look look at this old stuff. And uh, in the late 60s, like a lot of people of my generation, I ended up in San Francisco for a time, and I noticed that all the things that were in the junk stores in Rhode Island were in the antique stores in San Francisco. My older brother and I and another partner rented a truck and filled it up with this Victorian furniture and leaded glass lampshades and that type of thing. We trucked it out, we rented a storefront in Corte Madeira, California. We opened Mount Ararat Antiques. We sold the stuff, I ran the store, and I quickly realized that what I really liked doing was working on the furniture and not running a retail business. This is the sound of the 19th century. My father at the time was uh, diagnosed with cancer, so I thought it would be a good idea to come back to Rhode Island and reunite with my family and see if I could find a furniture maker to apprentice to. I found a guy in Allenton, Rhode Island, in Johnny Northup, and he was an old swamp Yankee, if there ever was one, and he was a wonderful teacher, and I worked for him for four and a half years. I was very influenced by his aesthetic. And his aesthetic was, if it was early, it was good. If it was late, it was bad. And there was nothing worth keeping made after 1815. And so I thought, well, that, when I started, I thought, oh, that must, be, that must be the way it is. At this time, in 1975, the program in artisanry had just started at Boston University. And I heard about it through John Kirk, who's a famous furniture historian, who was something of a mentor to me. And he was going to be running the American Studies Department there. And then uh, John Kirk asked me if I wanted to be in, in the undergraduate or the graduate level of the history class. And I said, I didn't know what was the difference. He said, well, there's a test. You have to take a test. I said, OK, what's the test? And he said, I'll give it to you right now. We're standing in a hallway in a classroom building in Boston University. And he opens up his briefcase, and he pulls out two black and white 8 by 10 photographs of two different Chippendale chairs. He says, OK, one of these is an original period Chippendale chair. The other one is a centennial reproduction, which is which and why. And I said, well, obviously, this one's the centennial. Look how shallow the carving is. He said, OK, you're in. <laughs> this is a chair that I made in 1977 when I was at Boston University as a grad student. The assignment was to make a 10% chair, meaning that it was meant to be engineered 10% above the breaking point. I can pick out here, there's an oriental influence to the crest trail. And uh, I had been looking at uh, Egyptian furniture. So you can see this, the swag to the front rail that would be reminiscent of uh, Egyptian stools. What I found was that it's really the overall aesthetic that matters, not the period or the style or the country of origin. When I graduated from school in 1978, I asked the people at RISD if I could have a little show at Woods Gary Mansion. The turnout was fantastic. I got a commission out of it and sold a piece out of it, and I've been going ever since. I've been very fortunate. The whole process, thinking about a piece, designing the piece, drawing the piece, making the piece, finishing the piece, delivering the piece, it's like a life process that starts and ends with each piece, and some of them are more successful than others, some of them are difficult. This one belonged to my great-grandfather. It's an English tool with a walnut handle, beautiful brass works. I have this set of chisels, Buck Brothers. These also belong to my great-grandfather. I was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1952, lying in hospital, now women and infants. My mother's ancestor, her mother's maiden name was Hazard, and one of the Hazards came over with Ann Hutchinson and uh, he surveyed the streets of Newport in 1639. He helped lay out the streets of Newport. My great-grandfather, Frederick Roland Hazard, started a manufacturing business up in Syracuse, New York, the Salve Process Company. And this place at Narragansett was his summer home. This was the carriage house. This is a leg fragment from an Egyptian stool about 1800 BC. And what makes it meaningful to me, the, the shaping on it is beautiful, but also where the curved rail meets the leg, there's a little joint detail there that keeps the end grain of the rail from splitting. 
that is a joint detail that is still, I, I've used many times myself, and to realize that that joint is so ancient is uh, kind of a treat for me. This building, it was just sitting here empty, and it had lawnmowers in it, and a couple of great old cars that my uncle took away, but it's really very nicely built, and uh, it's just made a wonderful uh, studio space. This is a bandsaw. This is used for cutting pieces of wood that aren't going to be cut in a straight line for any kind of curved work. This one was made in 1907, and I bought it when I was 18 years old, when I first became an apprentice. An old man had a cabinet shop up near uh, Green Airport, it was going out of business. And I bought this machine, my joiner, which I'll show you in a minute. This is a joiner. Its purpose is to make rough boards flat. Early 20th century, sometime around 1910. A table saw, it dates from the late 20s or early 30s. And a shaper from them for $1,100, which uh, to me at that time represented my net worth, I think. It was, it, it was a scary amount of money. Since I had invested so much money into these machines, I was making a commitment to, to using the machines that was frightening at the time, but here I am all these years later and I'm still using the machines, so I guess it, as an investment it worked out pretty well. So this is a, the basic joint used in furniture making. Many years ago, a friend of mine who lived in New York was at a fundraiser at somebody's Fifth Avenue apartment, and there was more people than would fit at the dining table. And he said, why don't you design an upscale version of the old TV dinner table? so that people in these apartments can have a nice little side tables to move around as needed. And that was probably 10 or 15 years ago that he made that comment to me and I finally kind of came up with this design. Steinway & Sons every year make about half a dozen art case, one-of-a-kind pianos. I was lucky enough to make two of them. Once they approve a design, I send them my veneers and they veneer a rim. We make everything that makes it a piece of furniture. We do the, the top, the legs, the lyre, the key lid, the music desk, the, the top stick, and the chair. Then we crate that up and send it back to them and they do everything that makes it a musical instrument. The second one I did for them, they displayed it first at Steinway Hall across the street from Carnegie Hall on 57th Street and there's that famous curved window in Steinway Hall with the glass curves in like that so it looks like there's no window there at all. And that was a treat to see my piano sitting in that window. You know? I just made a conference table for the Maddox Alumni Center and that meant a lot to me because my father was a professor at Brown, my mother went to Brown, my father went to Brown, their parents went to Brown, and my daughter just graduated from Brown. One of the hazards was one of the founders of Brown. I have furniture at the RISD Museum and the Providence Athenaeum which is something I'm proud of so it was great for me to have a piece at Brown University, this institution where my family's had so much contact. And also it was nice to get a check from Brown. <laughs> This wood is Cuban mahogany, and it's been commercially extinct since about 100 years. Well, it still grows as an ornamental in the Caribbean basin. These planks here are Cuban mahogany. They're 12 and a half feet long, a couple of feet wide, so this was an enormous tree. The whole studio furniture movement was much more vital and lively in the 80s than it is now. There's the few and fewer galleries showing this kind of work. I spent some time last week with Rhode Island School of Design Furniture Department seniors and grad students, and there wasn't one of them who aspired to do what I do. Not one of them wanted to be a studio furniture maker. I mean, I'm really, a, in their eyes, a total dinosaur. You know, that, that this is not what they aspire to do at all. They want to be Philip Stark, you know, be famous designers. On the one hand, I've had more success than I ever thought I would but now it looks like the whole field is kind of slowing down, so it's kind of an arc there, I guess. Would you say that you're very emotionally attached to the property? Ask my wife. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. I always say I'm going out in a box. <laughs>